There is always something special about Thanksgiving. I don't know what. Maybe the giant turkey that took over half the table. Maybe the relatives who would come to dinner and after that start arguing over the most trivial thing. Maybe the cranberry sauce, which was the thing I was in charge of ever since I was a kid. I don't know. But it's something magical in the air every time. This happened two years ago. I was 16 at that time. That day, as I woke up and went to brush my teeth, I heard something in the street. With the toothbrush in my mouth and drooling toothpaste all over my slippers, I took a look out of the window. There, I saw a woman. She was running down the street toward the dumpster. But that wasn't the weird part. She was holding a pan in which a turkey was burning. I laughed and sprayed toothpaste all over the mirror. I then did my business, got out of the bathroom, put on my clothes, and wanted to go eat breakfast. But something told me to look out the window one more time. And boy, how I regret doing that. I looked out and saw her next to the dumpster, on her knees, crying her eyes out. I didn't understand what the big deal was. It's just a turkey. People are so sensitive these days, I said while I reached to pull the drapes. But as I did that, she turned her head and she looked right at me. Oh crap, I said. I couldn't move. How could I just stand there, watching a crying woman, and not go out and ask her if she's okay? I mean, my mom and dad taught me better than that. So I closed the drapes, put on my shoes, and went outside. I could hear her crying from inside my house. I looked left and right and saw that no one was around. I guess it's up to me to talk to this crazy lady, I said to myself while I started walking toward her. Excuse me, are you okay? I asked her. And that's what she needed to stop crying. But don't get me wrong, I would have preferred her to cry than to start talking endlessly about how Thanksgiving is ruined and that she can't even make a turkey and that she's worthless and so on. But there I was, a 16-year-old, trying to console a middle-aged woman, whom I didn't know, next to a dumpster. It's okay, we all make mistakes, I said to her. Then the woman got up from the ground. I'm Marge, what's your name? She asked me. I introduced myself, and then, out of the blue, she invited me over to her house so we can drink a cup of tea and talk. I wasn't prepared for such an invitation, and I definitely didn't want to go, and I guess she sensed my hesitation. Come on, George, I'm all alone on Thanksgiving, and we'll just have a cup of tea. It won't take long, the woman told me. How could I say no? I agreed, and then we started walking toward her house. She didn't live far from mine, but... I never saw her in the block. On the way there, I asked her if she moved in recently, and she told me that she did, one week ago to be exact. We went inside her house, and it looked strange. She had all these little sculptures of cats and dogs, but they were all white and didn't have any details on them. I took off my shoes, as she asked me to, and then she went into the kitchen to make the tea. Make yourself at home, George, Marge told me, and I started looking around. Besides those creepy sculptures, there were also a lot of pictures. On the wall, on the mantel, and the table. But the only person in those pictures was... Marge. It seemed that she didn't have any family. She didn't have any friends or anything. I took a seat on the couch, and something startled me. My heart stopped at the sound similar to a loud screech. Ah! I yelled. Marge came running into the living room. Is everything okay? She asked. But before I could answer... I saw something jumping from behind the couch cushions. It was a fat, white cat, similar to the sculpture she had all over the place. Oh, I see you met Snowball. He likes to hide behind the cushions, the woman told me before returning to the kitchen. As I was looking around the place, she arrived with the tea. It's chamomile, she told me while smiling, revealing a set of yellow teeth that almost made me throw up. It's fine, I said while taking a sip. It wasn't hot as I would expect it to be. She started talking about her cat and her sculptures. She told me that it was her hobby, and she liked working with her hands. Of course, as fascinating as I found all that information, I couldn't wait to get out of there. Can I use the bathroom? I asked her. Of course, dear. It's down the hall, last door on your left, she told me. I stood up and went over there, all the while thinking that I need to get home. I saw the bathroom at the end of the hallway, but I tripped on something and fell. I guess she didn't hear me. After I got back up, I saw that the carpet she had was out of place, forming a lump. As I tried to fix it, I felt something under it. Didn't feel like normal hardwood. 
I put the carpet to the side and I saw a small door right there on the floor. As I was normally a curious person, of course, I opened it, revealing a small box. What I saw in that box made my blood run cold. I saw pictures of boys that were probably my age, or even a year older or younger. They were asleep, I hoped. They had their eyes closed, and the pictures were taken at night, with the flash on, in some sort of a basement or something. George, is everything okay? I heard her voice coming from the living room. Yes, fine! I yelled, hurrying to get the photos back in the box and cover everything with the carpet. But as soon as I did that, I turned around, and there she was. Marge, at the end of the hallway. She was smiling at me. That gave me the creeps. Look, I don't know what your deal is, but I have to get out of here, I told her. It seemed that she was trying to stop me, and I was prepared to fight for my life. But something unexpected happened. As soon as I got in front of her, she moved aside, letting me pass. See you later, George, she said before laughing. I didn't think much about it, and I continued walking toward the front door. All of a sudden, my knees felt weak. I couldn't stand up anymore and I fell to the floor. What did you do to me? I asked with the last ounce of strength that I had. It seemed you liked the tea, Marge said before I blacked out. Did you enjoy the first story? If you did, I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. Oh, if you want your broccoli to be served fresh, then don't forget to hit the bell icon. Keep munching. What the hell? I said right after I woke up. I looked left and right, but all I saw was the back seat of a car. I couldn't stand up as I was tied. My hands and my feet were immobilized. Help! Let me go! I yelled again. It looked like the car was moving. I didn't know where this crazy lady was taking me. After about two minutes of consciousness, Marge talked to me. She spoke something that I couldn't understand and started laughing as if everything that was going on was funny. I struggled to get free, but of course I couldn't. The woman knew what she was doing. I wasn't the first kid she had abducted. I kept asking her all these questions, but she just ignored me. Instead of answering, all she did was hum a stupid song. After about 15 minutes of driving, I felt the car veer right. It seemed that we stopped. Marge turned off the engine, and then she put her hand on me. I was stuck in a position where I couldn't see much, but she turned me around so I could face her. She told me not to struggle, and that we're going to have a nice Thanksgiving together. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew I was in a lot of trouble. I knew that my life was in danger, and I had to do anything I could to escape. The woman told me that we're about to go to the edge of town. She rented a place there, and as she put it, it was a cozy place in which to have dinner. She started driving again, but this time, to make sure I was quiet, she put a ball of fabric in my mouth. That way, I wouldn't give her any trouble. After about ten minutes, Marge stopped the car. This time, I could see where we were. It seemed that she stopped at a supermarket which was open on Thanksgiving. She turned around with that creepy smile of hers, and she told me to be quiet. Then she took some sort of blanket and put it on top of me. Even though she had tinted windows, she didn't want to take a chance of anyone seeing me tied up inside the car. Marge got out. While I was alone, I struggled to escape. I moved around so much that my wrist started bleeding from the rope. She eventually came back, and I saw that she bought an already cooked turkey. She told me that, We're going to have the best Thanksgiving dinner ever. She started the car again, and in no time we were out of town. She ditched the main road and took a left turn. It seemed that we were driving on a country road. I could feel all the bumps in the road from the back seat. We're almost there, she told me while looking at me through her rear view mirror. She then stopped the car one last time. She got out, opened the back door, and dragged me out of her car. She left me there next to the car in the dirt and told me that she needs to get the turkey inside first. My head was facing the ground, but as I turned around, I saw that we were next to some abandoned building. It was a small building with all of its windows boarded up. Marge came out through the front door and she was holding a knife. I was scared out of my mind. I thought that she would come and put that knife right between my eyes. 
As she approached me, I started squirming on the ground. She started laughing and then looked at the knife. Don't worry, honey, I'm not gonna kill you right here in the open. We're gonna have dinner first, the deranged woman told me. She then dragged me inside. The place was empty. It only had another door, a table, and two chairs. I don't know where that other door would take me. Without wasting any time, she grabbed me and placed me on one of the chairs at the table. She was exceptionally strong for a woman her age. Then she took out that ball of fabric from inside my mouth. Finally, I could speak again. What the hell are you doing? You know you're not going to get away with this, right? I bet my family's looking for me right now! I told the crazy lady, but she didn't seem bothered by my words. She seemed more concentrated on carving the turkey. She cut me a piece, she cut herself a piece, and then she started to eat. I was still tied up, and I asked her how was I supposed to eat? She told me to use my mouth. But then I had an idea. It was a risky one. I would ask her to help me cut the piece of turkey I had on my plate, and then while she would be close to me, I would headbutt her in the face. Marge, can you help me cut my food? I don't think I can eat it like that, I told her. The woman rolled her eyes, but eventually she got up from her seat, and holding the knife in her right hand, she marched over. As she was cutting the meat, I hit her right in the nose with my forehead. Marge screamed as she took a few steps back. I thought I would knock her out, but that didn't happen. As she was squirming down there, I grabbed it with my hands tied behind my back and managed to cut the rope. Finally, I said while I used my free hands to untie my feet. Marge got up and came toward me, but having the knife, I had the upper hand. Go right over there and don't make any sudden moves, I told her, directing the woman toward the door, which I didn't know what had behind it. I was pointing the knife at her and told Marge to open it. You don't want to do that, she said, but I insisted. Finally, she opened the door, and then what I saw shocked me. Several corpses were spread across the concrete floor. They were boys close to my age. They either had their necks cut or were stabbed in the face or chest. You sick fuck! I yelled. I noticed that there was a key in the keyhole. I grabbed it and locked Marge inside. The next thing I did was to get into her car and drive to town. I arrived at my house. The police were already there. My family called them because I was missing. I told them everything about Marge, and we went back to the building. As we entered, I noticed that the door was open. I ran toward that room, and then I yelled, Fuck! She escaped! There was no sign of Marge, only the corpses I found earlier. The police started an investigation and returned the bodies to their families, but the murderer was never caught. And even to this day, I'm afraid to walk the streets alone. I've actually had stalkers ruin two separate Thanksgivings, each about five years apart, and the first was at an alarmingly young age, too. I was 13 while he was 12, and we had math class together. Pretty much everyone knew he had this huge crush on me, which wouldn't have been a problem on its own, but, but this kid was also the biggest perv I've ever met in my life. I know that's quite a bold claim for a 12-year-old, but it was a huge problem at our school for a while. He used to try to look up girls' shorts or grab them in the hallway. He once got caught sneaking into the girls' locker room with one of those old-style flip phones with a camera, too, and I had no idea how he managed to get away with just a few weeks' suspension over it. Needless to say, it was no surprise that he began to harass me when he asked me out and I rejected him. He would wait for me at my locker every day and whisper creepy stuff to me as I walked past. Stuff I definitely wouldn't be able to type up word for word because it had 100% get this taken down. He then started following me to class. Like I have no idea how, but he worked out exactly what my timetable was, so he was able to basically just track me around school. I told my teachers, the school counselor, the vice principal, but nothing was done against this kid. The best they could do was switch my classes so he'd have trouble tracking me, and that worked for about a week. After that, he escalated and started following me out to the bus. After a while, he'd managed to figure out my schedule, my bus number, my student ID, and was in the process of finding my home address and phone number. Then right when I was at my breaking point, he asked me out again. Like, it wasn't just to get back at me for rejecting him. He honestly thought that harassing me would, like, bring me around to the idea of dating him. 
This went on from the beginning of the semester, and right around Thanksgiving time, I actually screamed no in his face. I was just so scared and tired and mad by that point. He actually looked kind of shocked for a second. But then the ugly little worm in him came out, and he told me he was actually going to come over to my house on Thanksgiving itself, and he was going to bring a gun to kill me and my whole family. I didn't believe him at first, but he did have a gun, but... I had already told my math teacher about it, and cops came over to his house a few days prior to check his thinking, as they put it. And thank God it was just an airsoft gun, and he was obviously just intending to scare me, but if he'd have shown up with that thing, I know for a fact that my dad would have just blasted him without checking if it was real or not. I thought the school would finally expel him after that, and thankfully, that was the final straw for the principal who had him transferred to a school for kids with behavioral problems shortly after. That was nearly almost 20 years ago now, and I live on the other side of the country, so I'm not too worried about him finding me. But it definitely stuck with me for a long while, and seriously colored my opinion in men in a distinctly negative way. My second stalker was a guy I dated in high school. Since we were headed to different colleges, I broke up with him just after graduation, and he basically just went nuts over it like actual clinical nervous breakdown type thing. I think that was just leftover stress from the SATs or how I sort of started to compartmentalize it at first. He got worse and worse as the months went by though and finally, when I traveled home for Thanksgiving, he tried breaking into my mom's house while we were both asleep upstairs. He stalked me almost everywhere I went and till I could put together some actual evidence of what he was doing, the cops couldn't do a freaking thing. When I got a new car, he called my work from the business next door and told me my new license plate. He was just relentless. One night, he called my house like every minute, on the minute, for almost an hour straight. My parents had to unplug all the phones to get some peace, and my dad called the cops from his cell phone. This all came to a head when he attacked me one day when I was walking downtown that same Thanksgiving weekend. I was with a friend at the time, and... He must have gotten a visit from the cops and assumed it was me that called them. He hit me so hard that he almost fractured my orbital socket. And finally, he went to jail for a few months and that gave me a way out. I moved an hour away, changed my number, got a new job, and blocked him on any social media I had. In addition to lockdown privacy settings, he's moved to a different town and is still wildly unstable. My life has gotten so much better and I've had so many positive changes and I hope he never hears about any of it. But there's definitely a little piece of my trauma that I'm not able to let go of. Stuff that just changed you and you're left constantly looking over your shoulder, carrying a taser, always ready to fight if that one nightmarish person turns up in your life again. Because I know that if he does find me again, he won't give me another chance to get away. He'll kill me. I know he will. So I always have to be ready.